Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I just want to go through uh, some housekeeping in that just to let you know your mics will remain muted for the whole uh, presentation. Uh, but if you do have any questions or comments, if you use the Q&A function on your right hand side of your screens um, and we'll pick those up. Um, once the talk finishes, uh, we're going to read the questions to the presenter and have him answer them. Um, so yes, please do stay to the end if you want to hear the answers to the questions that are raised during the evening. Um, you can also turn on your closed captions if you would like subtitles. Uh, next slide. Uh, so thank you for joining us for a short history of bees and flowers, the first 150 years. This is our first evening talk as part of our series for the Bee Superhighway. Uh, the Bee Superhighway project is uh, an initiative that Kenston and Chelsea Council are leading to create a new thriving pollinator habitat within the borough by introducing more wildflowers, more nectar rich planting and other features such as hedges, ponds, bug hotels and other things that are support important pollinators. Uh, as part of the project, we are developing education resources for schools and young people, providing guidance for residents and businesses of how they all can create their own pollinator hotspot or get involved with the project. And that will also include us giving away 10,000 packets of wildflower seeds to get you started. Um, we'll, as part of it as well, we'll also have a map that will show all of the pollinator patches as part of the project in the borough and we'll build on this over the years to come. We'll put the web address in the chat shortly. Um, but with, <laughs> before we move on, I'd like to introduce Richard Glassborough, who is chair of the London Beekeepers Association. This is a voluntary sector charity that promotes the craft of beekeeping, better public understanding of bees and better natural habitats for bees and Londoners. Richard lives and works in London. He started beekeeping in 2008, but is in fact trained in fine art. <laughs> and Richard has been working in creative industries for nearly 50 years. Um, but without further ado, I'd really like to introduce Richard to talk to, to tonight. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, yes, I have been keeping bees for quite a while and I've it's a complicated, it's become a complicated, a very popular and a very complicated um, area, particularly in London. Um, the public are extremely interested in bees, very tolerant of bees. I, it always puzzles me why people are so interested in stinging insects, but they are. And everybody wants to help bees. And this has led to some issues in London and the London Beekeepers Association have been looking into exactly what the situation is and we're very pleased to be partnering with Kensington and Chelsea on efforts to improve natural habitat for bees in London. So I'm going to, I'm going to, London is in a way a sort of microcosm of a, of a bigger story and so I thought I would make the story about as big as it can get. And I'm going to start with some photographs that are all taken in my garden in South London. So this is not um, David Attenborough style travel to exotic places, but I think it should give an indication just how much wildlife there is in our city and we don't notice it and there could be so much more. So I'm going to take the journey starting from here in my garden and I'm then going to go back to the origins. This is why I called it a brief history, the first 150 million years, because what you're looking at here is an amazing partnership. All these bees are photographed on flowers and the two absolutely go together, they are inseparable. And this was the, what I felt was the root problem that we had in London, that the craze for keeping bees was just keeping bees and people forgot about the flowers. So I started looking into just a little bit more about this partnership and it led me away from honeybees into all the other kinds of bees that there are 
and indeed all the other kind of pollinating insects and other animals. And I didn't realize when I started just how, what a big story this is. So we're going to go back to a very special moment in the planet's history. Um, I, I can't really say that plants invented flowers, but it seems a bit like that. Flowers came into being um, as, as plants evolved about 150 million years ago. And this is what the planet looked like, 100 more, it's what is known about 150 million years ago. Um, you can see South America here and Africa. India is in here, Australia is down here, and yeah, we're pretty much in the same place at that point. So you can see things were a little different. And if we look at the timeline, this is these bars, vertical bars go back in hundreds of millions of years. So here's today on the right, and 600 million years ago, and about 450 million years ago, the first land plants started to colonize, come out of the water. And it wasn't until, look at this, all the way up to 150 million years ago that the first flowering plants arrived. And the, the bees, the, the ancestral bees didn't arrive until about 110, 120 million years. So these are huge chunks of time. It, it's hard to get our heads around it, I know. And, and here we are, we arrive on the right hand edge. Our ancestors arrived about 200 million years ago and we a little less than 1 million years ago. So we really don't fe feature on this chart at all. And now the significance of flowers, flowers really, uh, I suppose, um, to put it bluntly, they're the genitalia of plants. It's the advent of sexual reproduction, two parts coming together, and it creates more variation because it doesn't always work out exactly. Before that, plants were cloning and making exact copies which works fine as long as just situations don't change. But with sexual reproduction, there is variation. And this is the way evolution works. It's not by design, so they don't change in order to solve a problem. They just change. And if there's an advantage in the change, then it will survive and probably survive very well. And it did, did allow plants to expand adapt to different situations, adapt to changing situations and become healthier and survive better. And it's quite a remarkable process really because there's the main thing that we're all familiar with the petals, but the seeds will be made in this part, in the ovules, and the male part, the pollen, comes from the stamen on the outside. And the pollen has to get from here to here, but on a different flower. Obviously, it's self, some of them are self-fertilizing, but it's most effective when it's on a different flower. And that requires something to carry it. And early, it probably would have been water in the first place and wind. But it soon, oh, here we have, my attempt to show this is this is a fraction of the evolution of one branch of plants just exploding into it's a difficult diagram to understand just the message is it's complicated but you're looking at 1.4 million species of organisms on earth and estimates of the numbers of undiscovered and under under described species range from 10 million or more um, it, the development of life is quite astonishing. And within that story, insects particularly, but within insects, bees, 
play a very prominent role. Again, this is a complicated diagram. I don't expect anybody to study it on screen. It's just the message is it is complicated. But here we're looking at the ancestor of bees, which in fact would have been a wasp. Bees and ants both evolved from wasps. And they branch out and these are the different families that we have today. And on the left here, we have a bee from, um, I can't remember the date of that, but it's a long time ago, fossilized in amber. And on the right, again in my front garden, um, a bee from last summer. So they haven't changed all that much. You can, this is the tongue here, the wings, can't see the antenna, but you can, there's a tongue in here. Four wings, prominent antenna, big back legs, big back legs, specialized for carrying pollen. And that at about 35 million years ago, we see the first honeybees, which is one of 20,000 different species of bees alive today or at least this honeybee is. There's eight different species of honeybee, but the, the most numerous one is the Western honeybee. And it's uh, <clears throat> it's not native to most of it. It's on every continent apart from Antarctica, but it's not native um, outside. It's a short origin. This photograph is the other side from the flowers, what it's all about, the pollen. This is what the plant is trying to move from its stamen to the stigma, to travel down the tube, to fertilize the ovules and turn it into fertile, fertile seed. Uh, these are magnified. I don't know what the magnification is, but it's an electron microscope image. So it'll be thousands of mag times magnification. The pollen that you do see on plants and it gets onto your clothing and you see it on bees, those are clusters of these. These are so small, even under a high powered optical microscope at 600 times magnification, you barely, you won't see anything like this much detail and you barely see much of the structure at all. So they are very, very tiny, which is why they give us so much problem with um, allergies and one of the reasons. But this stuff is making the world go round. So. so why do the flowers need the pollinators? I've mentioned that they are the vectors for plant reproduction, or at least the plants, flowering plants. And they connect the male and the female plant reproductive organs and produce, which produces or improves the production of fertile seed by some very large margin in some cases. And it's not just bees. Here we have a bumblebee. This is a hoverfly. Flies are very, there's, there's, I mentioned 20,000 different species of bee in the world. There are something like 60,000 different species of hoverfly, and I'm afraid I can't remember the numbers, but the beetles are um, huge, and butterflies, though butterflies, um, because their larvae roam natural habitats as caterpillars, their, their impact is very important on that side as well. So it's not just bees. Um, and why do the bees need the flowers? Well, the pollen is one answer. Pollen is high in protein and fatty acids, and they use it to feed the queen and the larvae. It's the, it's the rich source of food that helps them grow from uh, when the egg hatches, grows into an adult bee. And the nectar, which we are more familiar with when it's been de the water's been drawn off it and they've turned it into honey, 
but the nectar is also the source of this structure here. The, the wax, the beeswax is made out of nectar. Um, so their whole life has evolved to be dependent on the flowers and the flowers life has evolved to be dependent on the bees. And this is this is the thing that I've it's um, really important for us to understand these partnerships are prevalent throughout all forms of life on the planet and I'm afraid we do tend to forget that. Everything is connected to something else for their food, their security, their reproduction. And everything interacts. And certainly you can see the interaction between the bees and the flowers. They have co-evolved to be absolutely dependent upon each other. That's um, an upside down common carder bee and this shape here, this dark shape here, is the bee's tongue. And different bees have different lengths tongues, which tend to match the shape of the flowers that the bees particularly feed on. And some, some feed on one species only and other insects. I was looking for a slide of the famous um, moth that Charles Darwin was shown of a, with a very, very long proboscis and he predicted that they would find a flower that had a very, very long trumpet for the, the need for having such a long proboscis. And indeed the flower was found in Madagascar, but not until after Darwin's death. But this is co-evolution. So I've already mentioned there are 20,000 species of bee. 280 species can be found in the UK. And in fact, it's about half of those can be found in London. Um, I have to admit, I struggle with bee identity. It's not easy. Once you've got past the black with yellow stripes, um, it's quite challenging. But I have had, somebody has identified 41 species in my garden in South London. So um, there's more going on than we often are aware of because they're small and some of these bees are really small. Most of them are solitary. Honeybees are famous for being a social insect and, and, that, and that's one of the most impressive things about them. Uh, the high organisation of a collective body. We beekeepers tend to refer to the, not to the individual bees, but to the colony as the animal. And so you, you've got your beehive and in the winter it's a small dog and in the summer it's a large hungry dog. Um, and they just cycle through that year in, year out. I'm just going to step back a bit to the idea of a timeline. This will, the relevance of this will come a bit further on in the talk. This is the last 10,000 years and the or, from the origin of us humans. And you can see our population didn't grow very much 4,000, 2,000 years ago. Naught, and then it started to pick up a bit. I can't unfortunately zoom in on this um, software, but in here there's a wobble. It goes down and then back up, which is the Black Death. So I don't know. It, I don't know if we will show up with the COVID pandemic. The Black Death was a lot higher impact, partly because the population was below one billion, but 200 million Europeans died in the Black Death. And then just look at this. This is our population growth. And we see that in, in nature quite a lot. But it does have consequences. And we've had so associations with honeybees apparently for a very long time. 
40,000 year old cave paintings showing someone collecting honey and the bees. It crops up in, this is um, in Maya, in central and southern America, um, at the god of the bees and the form of beehives they're showing. They didn't have the western honeybee then, of course, and they used a stingless bee. They, I say used, they managed. I call them semi-wild. A lot of people call them domesticated. If you work with bees, you know they're not domesticated. You can look after them in the box, but most of the time they spend as wild animals and they behave as wild animals and you try to stop them behaving the way they want to stop and you're the one who gets into trouble, not them. So as I've mentioned before, it's not just honeybees. This, this, these are some of the um, species that can be found in London. Um, there is one species. Uh, do we have it here? Yes, this bee here, Vipers group Bugloss mason bee, is actually unique to London uh, because Brownfield site, the all the ground up rubble of concrete, simulated chalk downland, and the Vipers Bugloss colonized it and then along came the bee. So it just shows how resilient nature is when we leave it alone. It thrives on our neglect. Just to get a rough idea of the scale of what we're talking about. The, the number of land plants, um, the, the information seems to be very dependent upon what you're talking about as a land plant. There seem to be five groups if you include fungis, but apparently fungis are closer to animals than they are to plants. Um, but of the green land flora, the Q figures put it at 390,900 species. And insects, over a million have been identified, million species. But the total is thought to be closer to 5.5 million, and I've seen even higher estimates as well. Well, I think they're a bit more than estimates, but. And the biomass of insects is approximately 70 times, that's the weight, 70 times the mass of the human population. I don't know at which point that was taken, so obviously that could be out of date quite quickly at the rate we're expanding. But it does give you some, these tiny things that we tend not to see are playing a vital role in the way this planet works. All those, they're involved in all of those interconnections that I introduced you to a short while back. And We've most of us have heard by now that bees particularly pollinate one in three things that we eat, both directly and indirectly. Some describe some scientists describe their involvement in ecosystems as possibly even more important than that. But it's not just what we eat by uh, the, the fruit, nuts, and um, direct directly pollinated plants. But a lot of the meat and poultry, and indeed even fish that is farmed, is fed on vegetation that has been pollinated by bees. So your milk has bees in the story. They don't eat grass all the year. In the winter, in the winter, they will be fed on legumes and other plants that have been pollinated. Just a few samples here. I mean, the the, the number of things. Um, it's hard not to find. It's hard to find something that hasn't been involved with, particularly bees. They they, not not honeybees, but bees. Pineapple, however, is pollinated by hummingbirds, and they they're not required to be pollinated for the fruit fruit to set, 
but to grow the seed for the next generation, the seed has to be set. Tamarind, which is a tropical, um, I don't know, call it a spice. Uh, it, it's one of the ingredients of Worcester sauce. It's very commonly used in Asian cooking. Um, and that's pollinated primarily by what we know as the giant honeybee, Apis dorsata. That's, um, we don't have them in this country, but they are big and they are very defensive. And the coconut is pollinated particularly by stingless bees. These, as I say, they're just a sample. Um, almonds, you've probably heard about the stories of the migratory um, beekeepers in the United States who, a lot of them will overwinter their colonies on the east and then they drive them across the North America to start with the fruit harvests in the, in the southern states of California and they travel up the Pacific coast as the spring moves north. But the scale, 81 billion honeybees from 1.6 million hives pollinate over two and a half trillion almond trees. I have to say that's not a very happy story that it's, it's intensive agriculture taken to, well, to, to extremes, but there are problems with that, which we will see in a minute. Chocolate. Everybody likes chocolate. Not many people like midges, but it is midges that pollinate the cocoa plant from which chocolate is derived. So I'm afraid you've got to recalibrate your opinion of midges. I don't think there's much cocoa grown in uh, Scotland, but the vegetable, a lot of the vegetables we eat are harvested before the, the plant flowers but some of the plants have to be allowed to go to flower in order to produce seed for the next generation so again even if bees haven't pollinated the cabbage leaves that you eat they have pollinated to produce the seed from which the cabbages can be grown so i i hope that's sort of given a, uh, this is going at some pace, I'm just skimming that these are big, big subjects, but I hope it's apparent just how important to us and to the planet pollinating insects are, this relationship between flowers and insects. And now there's a bit of bad news, I'm afraid, because 40% of the insect species are threatened with extinction and the Lepidoptera, that's moths, hymenoptera, that's bees, wasps and ants, and dung beetles, coleoptera, are the most affected. And the biggest harm that's being done to them is habitat loss and can, intensive agriculture in particular is removing, because intensive agriculture covers 12% of the land mass of the planet that has a huge impact on the biodiversity, losing its habitat that it needs. Agrochemical pollutant is a polite way of saying pesticides. And the chart there shows the breakdown of the different main factors associated with the harm that we're doing to this incredibly important ecosystem. And as a counteract to the harm that's being caused on that scale, we've had a lot of campaigns, Save the Bees, which are very well intended, but unfortunately, they're not, um, they're not entirely innocent of harm themselves because often they get carried away with slogans and the facts aren't right and they, give people either no information or wrong information and the actions that are taken upon that can be inappropriate. This has become particularly problematic in London where Save the Bees has been implied 
nobody asks which bees. So the implication is it's honeybees because most people only know about honeybees and bumblebees. And it's not honeybees, but honeybees, the, the number being kept has gone up and up and still goes up. And a lot of myself included motive for starting beekeeping has been to help the bees. And we've now got ourselves into a situation where that itself has become problematic for bees, for honeybees and wild bees. So it's important to ask which bees, and it, it most definitely is not honeybees. And the other side of that was, it was recognised about 10 or 12 years ago when this started, the word was that London is so green you can put bees everywhere. But actually, when you look at the um, breakdown of the type of open space that we have, a lot of it is amenity grassland, which is not much used to bees. But it is for a city, it does have quite a bit of open space, but there's a lot less opportunity for pollinators than was certainly believed to be the case when this started. So the London Beekeepers Association have been looking at this and we've produced a report called the London Bee Situation, which we're in the process of sharing with all the other beekeeping associations across London and the bee farmers and anybody who's in involved with bees in London. We're trying to, um, I won't say correct, but to get a more accurate narrative into the public domain so that people aren't taking inappropriate reaction, actions. Now, of course, we're not immune to habitat loss in London either. There's a lot of building work goes on, um, but this diagram here on the right, we're looking at Hyde Park. And we're looking at garden. Gardens are very important habitat, not just in London, but even in the countryside. I've seen science papers um, recognising the value of rural gardens to helping bumblebees over lean times in the natural habitat and their, their um, colonies do better the following year as a result of that. And so too in London, gardens are really, really important. But we are losing two and a half times that area every year. Which is quite scary. And a lot of that is front gardens. The big one is front gardens being paved so that you can save on your resident parking permit. It's all avoidable. I personally would rather pay to have a front garden, but there you go. And this is what we found looking at, it's deliberately kept in quite low resolution. This is Greater London and the depth of green is, is recording the abundance of good quality forage for pollinating insects and it it isn't new data but it's not thought that things have changed greatly um, but you can see that on the outskirts of London there's quite a lot of colour but as you come in it there's not much not surprising that really but there is less but when you look at this map, which shows data from the National Bee Unit, part of DEFRA, and it's a record of a record of registered hives that not all beekeepers do register their hives, but those of us who do, this is a collation of how many colonies per square, each square is a square kilometer, so that they're comparable. And you can see the densities tend to be more central. We've got some aberrations out here, but you know, outside here is countryside, so it's not quite so severe. But this is a problem area, and we do know that there are 
there are quite a large number of unregistered. The, the data is, the data is has to be treated with a certain caveat. We know that it's not perfect, but it's so extreme that waiting for better information isn't um, isn't isn't really an answer because. These bees, these honeybees, let alone the wild bees, are hungry. This is how much they need every year. 50 to 100 pounds of pollen, 300 to 500 pounds of nectar. That's a bath full of nectar per colony just to feed itself. That doesn't provide any honey for us to steal. And we did, a friend of mine and I did a rough calculation that we thought it was for the, for the registered colonies in London, it was equivalent to the Olympic swimming pool being full of nectar. Now that sounds a bit of a challenge, but actually there are 9 million people in London. It's not beyond possibilities to help bees if we all do our little bit. And that's what all the bee superhighway project is about. It's the London Beekeepers Association has an initiative which we've been developing for three or four years now called Bees and Flowers Go Together. Not the uh, trippiest of titles to a project, but it says what it does on the tin, as it were. And it's really just to remind people you cannot separate bees and flowers. And the, the best way to help any wildlife really is to do less harm in the first place and stopping habitat loss in the case of bees in London is something which we can all look to because we are, I'm afraid, all involved in a little bit of it here and there and it just needs thinking about. And making improvements to existing habitats, so the way that parks and gardens and Little corners, there's an awful lot of little corners of not doing very much land knocking about. Those could be improved um, and hopefully create new and diverse habitats. When most of the big expansion of London was during the Victorian, Victorian era and they were very good at building, keeping parks, keeping open space, garden squares, don't see much of that going on now. We, we really should, could ask more of our developers to keep the character of London going with new developments. And one of the things that we have is this um, from pots to parks, because not everybody has the opportunity to do a lot, but you can still do something. A flower pot can still hold a flower. And as I said, there are nine million of us. It is important that the plants are the right ones because not all plants are that supportive of um, biodiversity. Trees are good, flowering trees. Look for simple open flowers. This is an open flower. If you can see the stamen and the, the stigma in the centre of the flower, so can the bees. And that's a plant that they will be able to feed on. A lot of uh, very highly bred hybrids, they look fantastic, but they're little or no, some of them aren't even fertile, so they have no pollen. Um, it's these simple open flowers and there's no shortage of them. Try and choose flowers that spread through the season because the other thing that bees are struggling with in agri intensive agriculture, the most damaging aspect of it is monocropping. So you get these field upon field, square miles of rapeseed crop with a huge glut of nectar, which the bees go mad for. And their response to having that much food is their population skyrockets. The colonies get massive. And then suddenly it's harvested and it's gone. 
and there's nothing because the hedges have all been ripped up and flowers have been often treated with herbicides so they don't compete with the crops. But in your own garden, you can choose plants so that there's always something in flower. And I would say that in London, pretty much all year, something is in flower. The books tell us, the books about bees tell us that bees don't fly in the winter, but they jolly well do. It's rarely that cold in London that the bees aren't flying. And I've watched from in my garden, both my honeybees and wild bees flying throughout the winter, which is, for some of the species, is probably a response. But bumblebees aren't supposed to winter as a colony. They're supposed to winter as a um, hibernating fertilized queen. And we're seeing those workers, from, which means there's a colony, flying throughout the winter. And that's thought to be a reaction to climate global climate change, it's getting warmer. So avoid highly bred cherry varieties. One I would sing the praises of, it's not a native plant, but just outside the window where I'm sitting, there's a winter flowering honeysuckle. And that's been in flower since early December, and it's still in flower. And there have been bees on it every day that it's above freezing point and not raining. And it's like having your own safari park right right on your doorstep. So lots of variety, which is very good for the bees. It's a, It's been shown to be um, good for their health to have a variety of food sources, different plants. And I certainly think that uh, London honey has a reputation for being particularly good. Um, as in it's got a very rich, complex flavour. And that comes from the variety of flowers that the bees can find in London. So just go mad with as, as much variety as you can. <clears throat> they also need habitat refuge areas, particularly solitary bees need somewhere to um, to raise their young and they, they offer a lot of them nest in the ground. So undisturbed ground sites are another aspect. Just It's just leaving, leaving little bits alone, the right soil type, and the bees will find it. I'm going to finish with, um, or nearly finish, with a compilation of video that was filmed in my garden, mostly on, no, it wasn't all on one day, but um, I had to film this quickly at the end of the summer because we've been doing visits into schools to show children bees. And of course, we couldn't do that last year. So um, the plan was, and we carried it out, of, of doing virtual visits. So I needed some footage of bees before the bees went to bed for the winter. And this is, um, oh. I'm having trouble getting this started. There we go. Isn't technology wonderful? There's a little bit of soundtrack at the beginning, if it's playing. Yes. Okay. 
Yes, I was worried about this. Um, I'm afraid I'm not a fan of Microsoft Teams. The video is not playing. I can hear it, but um, we'll have to move on, Richard. I think so. Yeah. OK, so. This is my challenge to us Londoners and it would go very well with the. B super highway. If every Londoner planted one flower in a pot, that would create nine million flowers, and that's an environment for pollinators. The bee you see on the left was photographed through the window of our sitting room, and that bee is on a plant in a window box. We're lucky we have a garden, but if you don't have a garden, do find somewhere to put a plant with the right kind of flower, and you will find bees visiting it almost immediately. So that's it. I'm sorry about the video, but. Oh, Richard, thank you very much. Um, so um, I've got lots of questions that have come online while you've been talking and thank you for that presentation. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Trevor, one of the education officers in Holland Park, and there's been a few questions. Are you OK asking questions? And then to let everyone know, we, um, we're hoping to finish around half seven, but um, if you're welcome to stay on while we go through the questions. And as Leanne, my colleague, mentioned, this is the start of the B Super Highway events, and the next talk coming up will be our um, Jeff Ollington talking about bees in the city and pollination on April the 7th, and that's bookable through the library service as well. So, um, can I just Richard, say, Trevor, with Jeff Ollerton, you're going to get the real authority. He is the authority on pollination. Ah, uh, thank you. I, but you're doing yourself a disservice, Richard. There, you know lots and lots of cool facts as well. So, my first question, Richard, is: Can you explain the difference between bees and wasps? Um, Jonathan was asking. The obvious difference is that wasps are carnivores and bees are herbivores, but they're very similar apart from that. Is it right in thinking that um, bees evolved from wasps? Yes, bees and ants both evolved from wasps. Oh, and then a supplementary question, um, the role of wasps in the environment, so they're herbivores, do they play like a recycling role? Can you say that again, please? The this follow up question is the role of wasps in the environment. Um, what ah. sort of role do they play? Yeah, wasps get a bad press, but they're actually a beneficial insect. It's difficult to persuade people of that and particularly beekeepers, but um, they do get involved in pollination. They are particularly important as um, predators on insects that can become pests. I'm thinking particularly aphids. And I've heard there's a role that they play with yeast. Someone once told me that. No wasps, no bread, no beer, oh, really? no wine. Oh. <laughs> so um, it go, going back to that diagram that I showed earlier in the talk about the network. Everything is connected. Everything is connected and you remove part of that at your peril. So that's sad. My, my, in my view, and I'm not an expert on this, but a wrong road was taken with the intensive agriculture mm. and depended on spraying to subdue what they call pests, but the pests were there because there was nothing else eating them. The, the habitat had all gone that supported the predators. And then, then they have to. Oh, it's just hideous. <laughs> um, mm, so, learn to love. Well, it's hard to love wasps, but they're pretty impressive, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, and that's also a very sort of human view, isn't it? That what what, do, what animals do for us is kind of like you say, it's kind of interconnected. Um, going way way back in time, uh, anonymous asks if forests were successfully growing over the earth for 250 million years. How did the early trees reproduce? That's a tricky one for you there, Richard. 
I'm not a botanist. I'm not going to attempt <laughs> to answer that. <laughs> I, I suspect it's more wind pollination and and then it, it co evolved. Um, and then a slightly a nice question for your next one. Um, bumblebees. Um, Stephos is saying I like pandas. They're quite huggable in their appearance. Are they closely related to honeybees? Um, they're in the same Apidae family, but <clears throat> not really. It depends what you mean by close. Comparatively, I suppose. But they're not a bee that you'd you would ever produce honey from. They only produce enough for their their um, they have a, nests. They have a very different. They are social, but the bumblebee um, just just put a ticket on your hat that what the books say doesn't always happen. I've just told you that I've seen bumblebees all winter, but the the lifestyle of bumblebees in this part of the world is that they have a small colony throughout of about up to maybe 400 would be quite a large bumblebee colony um, and their nests are quite chaotic they don't make honey which is a winter food store because they overwinter as a mated queen who hibernates so she's got fat stores in her body finds somewhere sheltered to overwinter and re-emerges in the spring to start a new colony to produce new queens for the next year. Um, honeybees exist as a colony throughout the year. They just grow during the summer so they're a big enough animal to go and send out lots of excess workers to collect enough nectar, not just to keep them alive, but to keep them alive during winter when traditionally there wouldn't have been any nectar for them to harvest. It's nectar and pollen. Um, so they don't want to remain a big animal for the winter because that would have to eat more. They'd have to store more. To, it's just not necessary. There's, there's no work to do. Mm. And part of that can be observed in the fact that the worker bees during the spring and summer their life expectancy is about six weeks. And the bees that are born, what we call the winter bees, the bees are physiologically slightly different at the end of the summer. And they have a life expectancy of six months. And part of that's to do with their body chemistry and the, the um, I don't know what you, whether it's hormones or what, but it, there's, a, there's a, a chemical that they're carrying more of that extends their life expectancy. But most of all, they've no work to do. Right. Poor bees in the spring, they're worn out. You know, there's bits falling off. You, you, can, you can see them. If you see bumblebees and honeybees late in the... Well, honeybees are slightly different because they're being replaced all the time. But the bumblebees, you very often see them, the older ones, their colours all faded, sun bleached, their wings are all tatty. And eventually they, they, they just fall to bits. They work so hard. Cool. No, that's thank you, Richard. Uh, there's a few questions um, around how bees collect their honey. So um, they're asking, do they detect flowers of interest by smelling the flowers aroma and how they let other bees know where the flowers are? And then questions, I'm sure you've heard this question before, how many flowers are needed to fill a bath of tub with, with nectar and a question around how much honey does a single honey bee right. produce? Okay, um, where shall I start on that? Uh, they, yeah, it's it's a, it's one of the most fascinating areas of how honey bees operate, actually, because they have a workforce, as I say, from hatching or sorry, emerging. They hatch from an egg into a larvae. They emerge after 21 days and they become workers starting with housework and after three weeks they graduate to flying as uh, foraging flying bees bringing back nectar pollen water and a sticky uh, substance called propolis now they are some of those are specialists and they are we call them scout bees they're specialists, they're very good at finding new sources of food and they will fly randomly until they find it. Their sense of smell is supposed to be a thousand times more potent than a dog. 
and they will use sense of smell. Their eyesight's not brilliant, um, but they do see colour, which is why colour is an important feature of flowers. The, the flowers look quite different to bees than they do to us because they don't see red, but they do see ultraviolet, and there's a lot of ultraviolet in the patterning of flower petals. And so the flowers kind of signaling the bees over here, over here, over here, and the nectar's down this way, by the way. It's a sort of signposted route. Um, those scout bees then have to go back to the hive, the nest, and tell the main foraging workforce what they found and where it is, which direction and how far away. And this is where they conduct this dance. They convey all that information in a dance in the dark. And it's also vertical to give an angle between the entrance and the flowers and the sun. So it's conceptual, I'm afraid honeybees are capable of doing vector mathematics. I certainly can't. Some of you in the audience may well be able to. Uh, so they, they, the scouts go out, they find a good source and honeybees like to forage on the same flower. They're flower faithful. They will bring their nectar back and their pollen back from what they've been first shown to be worth harvesting. So that's why planting for honeybees, they like drifts big expanses or big flowering fruit trees of the same um, flower. Bumblebees are much more likely to, they go from one species of flower to another and they hop around. Um, they're, not, they're not bothered by that, by it being the same. And then they bring this back and I, you can hear, if you keep bees in, in your garden, you can hear it on a warm night sometimes. They've been bringing back nectar all day and that, and that's measurable that some research has uh, instruments on the hives that show the weight of the hive going up during the day as the as the work as the foragers bring back nectar and then in the night time they other workers fan their wings to create a, a draft of warm air over the nectar to evap nectar is basically 60 percent um water and they have to reduce it to, to below 20 percent otherwise it ferments and they do this by fanning their wings and sometimes on a warm evening I walk down the garden and it's like a factory you can hear it humming and smell the honey um, as they're driving off the water so they need they need to collect three times as much nectar to create. So a jar of a one pound jar of honey, they will have to collect three jars of nectar and another three jars to keep them alive, give them energy while they're collecting that. So that's six to one ratio. And a jar of honey, so they're not very big honeybees. You can imagine they carry the nectar in there. They have what's called a honey stomach they fill up on the nectar, fly back to the nest, and a, a one pound jar of honey represents something like a million visits to a flower, to flowers. <clears throat> it's an extraordinarily val valuable resource. I hate wasting honey because <laughs> I know how hard they work. Indeed. <clears throat> so it's just um, come up to half past. So um, I'm very I'm happy, happy to, to ask Richard. More. I think there was another part to that question. It was quite a long. It was long indeed. Part. So I think the second part was referring to, yeah, um, I think you mentioned it, how much, how many flowers they need to visit to create um, mm. honey and sort of how much honey would they need to create to, to fill up a bathtub? <laughs> we, it's, 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 it's the equivalent of flying around the world for one jar of honey. All right, cool. <clears throat> and we did a similar calculation last Christmas on wax. This is the sort of thing beekeepers do in the winter when they've got nothing better to do. Um, a discussion about how we were making wax candles and we thought, how much would that cost if you were paying the workforce a living, uh, not a living wage, a minimum wage. And I think it worked out at something like 20,000 pounds 
we calculated the number of because wax is more expensive for them there's a three to one ratio nectar to honey it's five to one nectar to wax so that was a the wax is really really expensive for them not cheap for us either but so what I might do is give you a quite a negative question and then end with a positive question if that's okay with everyone so there's a few people that are put together in the question um, and they're asking let's find them about the threat of coronavirus on to bees and also the the effect of crops which I think you mentioned genetically modified crops how much of a threat they are what are your views on that the the threat of coronavirus I I really don't know other than I mean sorry, the, Verona virus um, Vero, uh, the Varroa mite yes sorry I may have said sorry. Corona I meant to say Verona sorry apologies Varroa mite yeah yeah all honeybees have got Varroa mite well I, I, um, that's not true but you make that assumption there's there's a great desire to find bees have become immune to it, but it only arrived in this country in 1992, I think. Um, and all of our colonies have got it. Some people will maintain that they don't have it. They usually don't look. Um, it was there was some research done I think it was about it was published last year an American scientist called Sammy Ramsey um, it was thought that the varroa mite principally feeds on the larvae but then fed on the adult bees on their hemolymph their blood and when he looked for the source of that scientific fact it was found that nobody had done the research it was an assumption and he did some research very good research and showed that it doesn't the, the mites do not feed on the adult hemolymph they feed on what's called their fat bodies which the nearest equivalent to us would be your liver and the fat bodies are particularly developed in winter bees because this is where this phytogelin is produced that determines the life expectancy of the bee. It lengthens the life expectancy. So actually the impact of the mites on the adult bees is much more serious than had previously been thought. And I suspect we've been talked about this a lot. This is the time of year, late winter, early, March, early spring, when people are reporting winter losses. That's colonies that <clears throat> have died during the winter. And I actually think that a lot of that is down to Varroa weakening the individual bee, winter bees. Mm. And it's pretty much behind most of the problems that we get because they stress the bees and they weaken the colonies. And uh, there are also vectors of other diseases, viral infections that are injected into the bees. And there's no silver bullet, <clears throat> but there are things you can do to keep the, the levels. It, 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 some chemicals involved, but my main treatment, it doesn't involve chemicals. <clears throat> it's still very infect, effective. But you can't, I say you can't, I can't. I think some beekeepers are probably managing to find ways, uh, running their, their colonies in such a way, I believe that they have smaller colonies with a design of hive that keeps the temperature higher. And honeybees have very high tolerance of, of um, temperature in the hive. And I think the theory is that they make it uncomfortable for parasites. There's certainly one of the honeybees. Um, <clears throat> you probably also heard about Asian 
Horny. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions, isn't it? Was yeah. Um, um, there's that research of using dung, isn't there, in front of the hives? I was reading to put them off. But anyhow, I digress. But Should they, I move on? I've seen Asian hornets <clears throat> in France, and they're, they're, they're in practice. Like was, you know, you have to admire that their strategy for taking down a colony of honeybees is, I don't, I don't exactly welcome it, but it, it is impressive, and you are looking at nature. Mm. But those come from a part of the world where the, the prevalent one of the honeybees is Apis serrana, which is a smaller honeybee than the <clears throat> our mellifera. And they have developed a defense against the Asian hornet, which is they ball it, they cover it and cook it. <laughs> Quite literally, they raise the temperature and kill the hornet. And the bees raise temperature, part, honeybees raise temperature as part of a way of controlling the um, climate control inside the hive and they run the nest at 35 degrees. Two years ago we had <clears throat> the bees from the east in March when the colonies are quite big so they've had a big brood nest that they have to keep at 35 degrees and the temperature outside was minus 10 and they would have kept it at, at, at 35 inside. So there is there is hope, the resilience of these, particularly the social bees, the resilience is phenomenal. It's the solitary ones that are so much more at risk from our careless disregard for their existence. So yeah, so the, the other so the, the other side of the coin, I suppose, is someone's asking um, anonymous, um, what would be the best four plants that you'd recommend that we could plant in our gardens or our, our planters to encourage bees? OK, well, I always answer first with crocus because I'm not a plants person and I can just about rem remember crocus. But uh, crocus. the reason for that is because it flowers at this time of year, which is when most if bees are going, if honeybees are going to starve, this is the time of year it will happen. When mm. they've depleted, actually, the in spite of the cold weather we've been having, I'm seeing a lot of colonies that are massive already and, and already storing honey. But um, <clears throat> so an early crop, an early flower to produce so snowdrops and crocuses. And it's nice for us too. let it not be forgotten that by improving the environment of London for bees, it's going to make it a lot nicer for us too. And um, I've already mentioned the winter flowering honeysuckle. honeysuckle. Yeah. Um, another important one for bees because it's late is ivy. But ivy only flowers when it's growing vertically. And people are very prone to rip down ivy because it's it's not like so many things. If you don't know, you know, it, it's not always a decorative plant. But it's important to bees because it produces a lot of nectar and honey stored in October. Fourth one. Um, the best thing you can do if you're interested in plants is go to the lbka.org.uk and look for the page plants for bees. There are there's a long list done as a calendar, so it tells you what time of year they flower. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. And like I say, this is the first of our Bee Super Highway events and there's a few others coming up, including Jeff's talk on April the 7th, followed by one on bumblebees on the 15th of April, followed by one on flies as pollinators on the 22nd of April. But Richard, I have a good question to end with. Um, ben asks, have you heard of the Bee Movie? How realistic is the Bee Movie? <laughs> <laughs> Us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you everyone for joining us and thank again to Richard and to Nina and Leanne for organising this talk and Richard thank you very much for all your advice and tips and there's a lot of nice positive comments in there and people want your powerpoints and your presentations for their to help their research as well so thank you again and like I say thank you again to everyone for joining us and hopefully you can join either us the Ecology Centre or the libraries in RBKC for future events. Thank you, good night.